Welcome everyone to the next Alumni Career Webinar, Why Executives Stall and Fail and How You Can Avoid It with Mark Nevins from the Class of 1986, President of Nevins Consulting. I'm Maura Sweeney, Director of Alumni Career Development at Holy Cross, and I'm delighted to have you on today's webinar offered exclusively for the Holy Cross community. We've reserved an hour and a half for today's discussion. Our hope is to make this engaging as well as informative. And so we encourage you to submit questions throughout the presentation by using the Q&A function located on the webinar control panel. I'll keep an eye on those questions as they come in and Mark will make time to address those as they arrive. So please submit those questions. We also have the questions that you submitted during registration. This presentation is recorded and will be made available to all participants in a few days. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Mark. So Mark is an executive advisor, consultant, and coach who works with individuals, teams, and organizations to help them perform more effectively, efficiently, and profitably. For more than 20 years, Mark has been advising and consulting to senior executives of dozens of large and small organizations around the world in many industries, in the private and public sectors. Mark is a longtime moderator for the Aspen Institute including the flagship executive seminar on values-based leadership and the special seminar leading change. He was a founding advisory board menu, excuse me, he was a founding advisory board member of the Institute for Executive Development and he has studied leadership, management, and organizational development extensively. In his corporate career, Mark spent 10 years in global leadership roles with the strategy and management consulting firm Booz Allen Hamilton and the executive search firm Corn Ferry International. In each of these roles, he led organization and executive development around the world and also oversaw the full range of human resource functions. Prior to his career in the private sector, Mark taught at Harvard for nearly a decade. He was graduated with honors from the College of the Holy Cross and he took his PhD in English literature from Harvard University. And I must say, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Mark over the past six months and working with him. And I really enjoyed the new book that he wrote, which he'll be talking about. So I'm delighted to have Mark here uh, to share his knowledge with all of us on the call today. And with that, I'll hand things over to Mark. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Maura. Thanks very much for having me. And, um, you know, for, the, for those in the class of 1986, when you hear someone kind of call out some highlights from your resume. But I think the first thing you realize is, holy cow, I don't even remember half of that stuff. And gee, I'm really old. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, and when you, when Maura asked me to, I did a webinar a couple of months ago about uh, really how leaders can be, try to maintain effectiveness during this unprecedented pandemic, which was, a lot of it was kind of leadership 101, but through a new, through a different kind of lens that none of us has ever seen before. And when she asked me to do another one, we talked and I said, well, what kinds of things do you think your, your uh, alumni network would be interested in? And we talked about points when in your career, you reach a stumbling block or you're struggling or how do I figure out how to get from this step to this step in my career? And I thought about it for a while. And then I said, oh yeah, I think I wrote a book about that. So we talked through the book and I'm, I am literally the worst marketer in the world. So many of my friends from Holy Cross and elsewhere have gone into marketing and I, I observe what they do for a living and realize none of this is in my DNA at all. Uh, so I don't, this is not going to be a book talk or some sort of um, uh, promotion. Uh, I wrote the book with a very good friend of mine simply because we were on a dive trip together. We go on a dive trip once a year and do a little bit of peer mentoring and life coaching and that kind of thing. And he convinced me that he, he'd been a longtime friend. His, if you look him up, John Hillen, uh, he was just elected today into the um, ROTC Hall of Fame. He was a decorated special tanks, a special forces tank commander in the first world war. He's run several companies. He was on the uh, staff of Condoleezza Rice in the secretary of state's office. Um, he's an unbelievably talented guy. And when he said he thought that he and I might have some things to say about leadership collectively. I said, hey, that sounds great to me, let's do it. Uh, and, I, and I didn't really enjoy writing the book. I don't know for those of you who are writers, um, I, look at, I look at writing somewhat the way I look at climbing mountains or hiking. Uh, I like having done it. I don't particularly like doing it. So uh, there was a point and I think I've, I probably came as close as I could come to knowing what a woman feels like in late in month nine of pregnancy where I just wanted this thing out of me. I wanted it, 
I wanted to be done with it. Um, and, uh, you know, and then you go through the whole process of getting it out there. And in hindsight, looking back on it now, because it's been, I think, two years since we published the book, um, I, am, I am somewhat proud of it. And I think it's a, a useful and pragmatic book for, for mostly for senior executives, but really for anybody who is in a role where they're responsible for dealing with managing complicated and complex projects and systems in complicated organizations and when um, they have to do that through uh, extensive uh, networks and groups of people. Uh, and that could be a startup, uh, which is going to grow quickly, or it could be a big multinational company. And I've worked with both and continue to work with both. So this is sort of a book report, but I don't want to just make it a book report. I'd like to make it uh, a presentation on what I think are the most important ideas that came to roost in this book. And so you don't have to read the book. Um, I'll just tell you what you need to know. And then hopefully you'll leave here with one or two ideas that will make you a little bit more effective. So whatever your job may be. And I, I've had people very early in their careers read the book and come back and say, hey, this actually helped me with something I was struggling with. Um, and I'm happy to hear that because it's not really meant to be only for senior executives. So the agenda today is, I think the hook, uh, and I can tell you, we had this idea, John and I together, we did a couple of more dive trips while we were writing the book. It was a good excuse to go diving. And we had, we, we called this the Dominica Epiphany. So there's a beautiful little island down, way down in the middle of nowhere in the Caribbean that you would probably never go to unless you're a scuba diver or you like to hike because there's beautiful um, volcanic mountains. Uh, this island was unfortunately wiped out in one of the bad hurricanes a couple of years ago, but they're coming back. And what we called the Dominica Epiphany was realizing that leaders face what we call challenges of complexity all the time. They also at various points face what we call challenges of sophistication. And sophistication challenges are very different from complexity challenges. And yet the way most of us are trained and, and educated is we, we don't really understand sophistication challenges. So we try to deal with them as if they were complexity challenges. Uh, and as a result, we, we fail because we're using the wrong approach to the problem. Uh, it's, a, it's an approach that will work in other situations, but it's not the right approach for this situation. And I'll talk more about that later on. Uh, because every great book has to have some number of things in it, we figured uh, we'd come up with seven leadership stalls. You saw the front uh, cover of the presentation with the pickup truck stuck in the mud. Uh, based on, I think, a collective 50 years or so between John and I of working with different kinds of companies and leaders, public sector, private sector, you name it. Uh, we did sit down and create a taxonomy, and we realized that when you're talking about uh, stumbling or stalling, it tends to happen in seven particular ways. Now, um, you may say, well, seven's the number everybody chooses, and I really didn't want it to be seven because it is, you know, seven habits of highly effective people, the seven days of the week, the seven deadly sins, you know, take your choice. Um, but we, we worked really hard and we think it really is seven. So if you think it's not seven, I'd love to hear about that because then if we do a second edition, we'll change the number. Uh, but I will talk briefly about seven stalls. I think you'll recognize them because all of us are going to face them. And this is also one of the important points of the book is, uh, ironically, it's the most successful executives and managers and leaders who face these stalls. Uh, the, the less successful ones tend to get derailed by mere complexity challenges. They, they fail in uh, you know, scaling the, the, the company in very basic ways. They can't get their hands around the technological challenge. They, um, they don't hire the right people. Um, those are the things that kind of separate the men from the boys, if you will, to use a, a dated expression. The, uh, the really effective leaders are the ones who have managed the, the complexity challenges, and then they struggle with these uh, sophistication challenges. And we think there are seven particular ways that happens. And then, of course, since just diagnosing a problem is not very helpful, uh, I'm going to try to give you a couple of suggestions. This is where you will have to go read the book. Again, not a promotion. You will have to go read the book because uh, what we wanted to do with the book was not simply have a theoretical book. We wanted to have a very practical book that says, if you see any one of these stalls and it appears to be, this looks familiar to you, we want to give you some ways to pull yourself out of the stall. So when you read the book and look, I'm happy to take questions as well. There are very, very specific tangible things you can do if you're struggling from stall number two or stall number 
five. Okay, so that's kind of what I want to do. And this is not a this is not an academic book, and my work is not academic. I happen to have a PhD, but it's in literature and not in business. Um, I don't think I'm the kind of person who would really enjoy being a business school professor because I'm more interested in in what's happening in the real world than I am doing a whole bunch of research to, you know, make claims about things. Um, but we did we did kind of do a little bit of mucking around because you have to. And what we noticed from our own personal experience, and this is dozens and dozens of organizations between John's client work and his leadership work, executive work. He's uh, a very, very experienced seasoned board member. And my work with dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of companies and certainly many thousands of executives at this point, is that almost all organizations, um, they make plans to grow or change. Strategic planning is an annual or biannual exercise. Every couple of years, you do a reboot on your long-term plan. Obviously, you've got your FP&A function. You've got your CFO. We're thinking about quarter by quarter our growth. Um, so they're constantly thinking about disruption. What are our competitors doing? But what they don't do, and, and I think this is, uh, I can't validate this with, you know, a sample size that would make HBS happy, but it's quite clear that a very small number of organizations, and I'm sure in your own experience this, a very few of them make deliberate plans to grow and scale their executives. They might run them through an occasional leadership program. Goldman Sachs or a Citibank is pretty good at this. They might send them off to a Wharton program or a Stanford program. But the, the planning to grow our people and our leaders alongside our plans to grow and scale the business happens pretty rarely. I would argue this is this should be one of the most important roles of any board of directors, particularly for a public company. And I think we could look around at the challenges, pick up any, any day of the Wall Street Journal, and look at the challenges that most companies have with leadership succession, with succession planning in times of crisis, um, and just with kind of growing their own talent. Right. Um, there's a reason why executive search firms are very, very busy, because most companies tend to look outside for their uh, next leaders rather than growing them themselves. So when we think about sort of what's your path as a leader, um, and this is something that's hard to imagine when you're, when you're heading into your first job, it's very, very easy to see when you've been working in any kind of an organization for a couple of decades, but there really is a journey. And the journey is a progression of how you spend your time. So earlier in your career, so we're going to read left to right here and imagine a timeline at the bottom. Earlier in your career, your responsibilities are mostly doing. New job, here, here's your task, work on these things, produce these deliverables. Over time, if you're good, we put you into a management role and then eventually you come into some sort of a leadership role if that's what you choose to do and if you demonstrate the capability and competency to do that and if you manage your career well. And one of the things we can, we can sort of describe this as is that over time, what happens is the importance of your technical and tactical capabilities declines. And on the flip side, I don't think it's really a zero sum game, but there certainly is some kind of trade off. On the flip side, what becomes more and more important to you is your strategic and interpersonal skills. Okay. So this is a crude diagram. Uh, you have to probably draw something much, much more complicated if you wanted to get this published in a, in a management journal. But I think if you, if you just think about your own experiences, and I'll give you one in a second, uh, the more senior you get in any organization, the more your success depends on having strategic and interpersonal skills. On the left side, we're talking about what I can do and how I can understand the present tense. As we move further to the right, we're talking a lot more about what I can influence and how I understand the future tense. And many times when leaders are struggling, uh, you can see that they fail in, in either of those areas. They, they, they can't deal with disruption. They can't imagine a better organization that serves its customers in a more effective way, or they just stumble and fall because they have bad interpersonal skills. And, you know, again, look at um, look at the challenges being faced uh, in the last couple of years by uh, Kalanick at, at Uber. Um, what's the fellow's name? Uh, who was at WeWork? Uh, uh, Zuckerberg certainly is a great example right now. When they're struggling, you know, Zuckerberg's not struggling because the core technology of Facebook is not working well. 
He's struggling because he has unleashed a set of really never before seen in the history of human interaction, unintended consequences that he just doesn't know how to deal with. Um, and maybe none of us do, but you know, it's not our jobs to do it, it's his job to do it. And uh, he's not exactly um, a 10 out of 10 on emotional intelligence when it comes to how he is engaging, particularly the outside world in solving some of these problems. So uh, enough Facebook bashing for the day, that's a little bit too, of a, too easy of a target. Uh, but as, you, as, you, as I said before, the, the left-hand side of this chart tends to be more the realm of complexity, whereas the right hand is the realm of sophistication, by which I mean, on the left-hand side, solving problems generally has to do with applying known solutions and known tools. We have come to an inflection point in our growth. We are opening up offices in a second or third country. We are um, you know, adding more features to our products, right? This is simply doing more or doing better of the things that we're very good at. The huge inflection points and the one that really cause us trouble are the ones that require um, a more sophisticated approach to things. I'll talk about this in a minute because this is the area where we talk about the seven stalls kicking in, okay? And the seven stalls typically face leaders. Managers face lots of challenges. We could do another session on the challenges that managers face, but for leaders and executives, and I don't say only executives, I do think that there are many, many leaders in organizations much lower in the organization. And I would even say that you want everybody in your company to be a leader, no matter what their title is. But when you're talking about significant leadership responsibility, um, it is a failure in your strategic and interpersonal capability that usually gets you into trouble. And again, you, you look at any problem in any organization, pick your case study and nine times out of 10, it's not going to be that they didn't have enough capital, um, they didn't understand their core product, their technology was crappy, um, you know, they didn't manage their balance sheet. I mean, there's examples of all these, but almost always those examples are traced back to individuals in leadership roles not dealing with sophisticated problems in the right way, right? Uh, I've often said that uh, it all comes down to dialogue, which is uh, maybe a little bit too simple, but I think if you have the forensic capability, you could take any bad business case and trace it to a conversation that didn't happen or didn't happen in the right way or didn't happen at the right time or didn't happen with the right people. Sometimes that's intentional. Sometimes that is desire to obfuscate. Sometimes that is unwillingness to have a difficult conversation. And sometimes it's just plain lack of recognition of how important the people component of the business is. I'll do my short um, commercial right now for emotional intelligence, which is a, a topic that's been bouncing around for a long time. Every four or five years, it's kind of, it's back in the zeitgeist again, and it's the cover story of HBR and every single book in the bookshop at the airport, you may recall airports. Um, uh, anyway, every single book in the bookshop at the airport has got emotional intelligence in the cover. This seems to cycle through every couple of years. I think, I think in some ways the pandemic has underscored how important this capability is. I think the kind of perfect storm of the, the challenges of the pandemic, realizing how important being together, human beings are social animals, and also um, the way we've been forced to rethink how we engage with each other using technology, using Zoom like this, um, has really brought to the forefront how important emotional intelligence is. But historically, and this is, this is I think, an important concept for those of you who and there are people, and I'm, I'm one of them. Uh, I have been one of them at times. For those of you who may be sort of rolling your eyes and saying, look, you know, I'm responsible for this unit of this big, tough company. You know, we build shit. We don't do this soft, touchy-feely stuff. It would be just, just to observe to you that um, this stuff really does make a difference. And my, my go-to case study since writing the book is one of, we have a ton of case studies in the book. We wanted to not just have academic theory uh, or kind of conceptual theory and then uh, a bunch of tools. We also wanted to have real people. So if you look at the book, we've got probably two dozen case studies of real actual people, not, you know, Tony is in his office looking out the window, thinking about the challenges of his supply chain. Uh, real people, real companies, who are willing to share not just successes, but, but failures. My co-author and myself among them, uh, we shared actual failures uh, in our own careers. And 
the, one of our case studies is a guy named Chris Howard. I won't give you his full resume, but uh, in a nutshell, he grew up, uh, he and his brother were the only two black guys on the football team at a high school in Texas, out in the middle of nowhere. He ended up going off to the Air Force where he trained to be a fighter pilot. And he was, an, I think, an academic All-American, uh, strong safety. Uh, brilliant guy, tough guy, has had some business roles and has found, ultimately found his career in college administration. And he's been a president of two universities now. And while a lot of people talk about the hard stuff and the soft stuff, right? So there's the, you know, there's kind of finance and strategy and operations. This is the hard stuff. And then there's, oh, you know, the soft stuff, like being nice. And, oh, I guess, you know, communicating effectively. Um, what Chris calls it is the hard stuff and the harder stuff. And that in some ways is sort of, that could have been the title of the book, might have been a better title, The Harder Stuff, uh, is recognizing that this, this stuff on the right-hand side, what we're calling these uh, challenges of sophistication are in fact, for many of us, much more difficult than the mere complexity challenges. And the way we like to think about complexity and sophistication, and this is one of those things that, you know, it's sometimes hard to explain, but every time I do, and everyone who reads the book, um, people just kind of go, oh, okay, I got it. Now I got it. Yes, I, I don't know if I can exactly describe it, but I've got it. And so one of the metaphors we use is that it's like the dark side of the moon. So challenges of complexity really come down to differences in scale. It's stuff we can see, we understand, we're gonna drop the lunar lander right there. We've done it a million times, we simulated it. Challenges of sophistication are, are difference in kind. This is something different. I can't just do more. I can't just bring in some lawyers or some consultants or some subject matter experts. I and we need to step back and think fundamentally differently about this. And I can give you some examples. Um, but the, the thesis of the book is that when we confuse what's really a sophistication challenge, we have to do something differently with a mere complexity challenge. And look, complexity challenges are plenty difficult. Uh, you want to install an entirely new uh, CRM in a global company. You've done a, a, a merger, you've grown by acquisition over five years with multiple uh, small companies, and now you have to sort of rationalize the entire information techno technology system. Look, these are not small problems, they're massive problems, but they're problems that you can break down into steps. Uh, and, and that you can bring in experts or you can hire a, a CTO who's done this before and they can do it. Let me, it might be more useful for me to give you some examples. Um, and this is one of those slides that I'm not gonna read because it's got too many words on it or will in a second, but I want you to have a look at this and just get a sense for what I'm talking about here. So I'm gonna lay out some examples on the left-hand side of complexity challenges and on the right side of sophistication challenges, okay? And you can read through these with me. I'm not gonna read them out loud, but you can read through them with me. I hope you can see the slide and see what I'm talking about. Um, so the left-hand side tends to be things that are well understood processes. The right-hand side tends to be related issues that are more about, they're meta issues. They're less about doing the thing and they're more about the why and the how or the what of the thing itself. Okay. Okay, so I'll pause here for a moment. I've got one more slide uh, that I'm gonna show you that's similar to this one that again, tries to make the point of why do we think that differentiating sophistication challenges from complexity challenges is the key insight. Uh, and hopefully by showing you a bunch of these, you can look at your own organization, your own role and say, hmm, yeah, in the past, maybe there was my own case study where I was trying to treat a sophistication challenge like a complexity challenge or where um, I, I was changing the wrong thing. Okay, so I, this, this, is, this is in some ways maybe this kind of the secret, uh, Pee Wee's secret phrase for this whole webinar. It's what are you trying to change? And in complexity changes, we're often trying to change 
what's around us. You think about the classic 7S model, right? So there's, if I can remember them all, strategy, structure, systems, style, staff, skills, and shared values. And in another uh, scuba diving, I think this one was in the Dominican Republic, another scuba diving uh, insight, John and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's actually an eighth S. And the eighth S is self. I know that's a little bit cute, but if you look at the right-hand side here, what you'll see is that addressing the sophistication challenges ultimately come down to me changing how I am leading. Where am I spending my time? Where am I focusing my energy? What am I not doing? Uh, how am I challenging people to think differently? How am I telling a story in a different way about what we're doing and why we're doing it? How am I spending my time not doing things like building or uh, uh, writing or uh, you know, working through the, the spreadsheets for the business, but how am I spending my time instead going out and engaging with people key stakeholders in non-transactional kinds of conversations about where's this business going? Who really is our likely competition in the future? Is this story compelling and inspiring internally and externally? Does anybody really care? And then looking in the mirror and asking yourself some tough questions like, am I credible? Am I generating real engagement and real followership? If I'm not, how can I do something to get people to listen to me and, and take action, and it's probably not going to be about me showing them how smart I am or this brilliant new idea I've got. It's going to be about creating a story where they become characters in the story and they see a benefit to whatever change we're trying to bring about. Okay. So these two distinct challenges require us to take actions in different ways. And again, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read the whole slide. Uh, we'll make these slides available to you later on if you want them. Quite happy to do that because uh, I know I'm going quickly through these couple of slides here. But when we look on the left-hand column again, we're going to see kind of pretty well-known, not easy, not simple, not trivial, often very expensive and sometimes even multi-year projects, but ways that we are tackling a complex challenge versus on the right, it's how do we tackle this sophisticated challenge in a very different way. So again, just have a look at this. Given your experience, given your role, given the kind of organization you work in, some of these will probably resonate more than others. But again, the, 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 the key message we're trying to take away here is that there's a difference not just in, in kind of scale, but in kind. And, and when you think about places where you've struggled, when you look at it, it's fun to go, you know, having, having created the seven stalls model, now I love to sort of look at business cases in the news and say, well, yeah, there's a two and a four, uh, you know, here's a one and a seven. But the things on the right are the things that, you know, to, to quote the old phrase, things that they don't teach at Harvard Business School. Um, and they're things that are more in the knowledge of wisdom than they are in the, uh, in the realm of uh, wisdom than they are in the realm of knowledge, right? It's having the sophisticated ability to step back and say, what I need to do here in this situation is not simply call a town hall and give everybody a more challenging target. It's to step back and say, okay, um, how am I engaging with external customers uh, with the marketplace? Am I thinking about fundamentally, do we have the right strategy? Do we have the right operating model? Uh, are we telling the story and have we built the right kind of culture so that people can execute and understand that what is needed from us, all of us tomorrow is different than what was needed from us yesterday. So I'm going to leave um, the wordy slides now and I'm going to do a quick run through the seven stalls. Before I do that, I will pause. And I'll see if there are any questions, if uh, any of this makes any sense. And if you, you know, if you want to tell me, yes, I absolutely get it, complexity versus sophistication, that's a good, 
that's a good sort of lens to use uh, in my day day to day work as a leader or manager. Uh, or if you think it's utter, utter nonsense and you want to challenge me on that, I'm also open to any of that. So, uh, more I think you have the the screen of any questions. And I'll ask one question that had come in from registration that I think is is really appropriate for this point in the conversation. Someone asked. You know, how do these leadership challenges vary by industry or company size, or do they? Well, they certainly do. Um, you know, every industry has its own culture. Every company has its own culture. And I don't just mean, you know, do we like Coke or do we like Pepsi around here? Um, having worked in a lot of different organizations, I can tell you that working in a New York City not-for-profit is very different from working for a global French-based engineering firm, right? And for obvious reasons, right? Size, uh, physical location, um, general sort of uh, uh, company mentality, some of which is industry or functional focused. You know, an investment bank has a very different uh, culture than a media company is. Probably the cultures of you know, UBS and City or Chase are more like each other than they are like NBC Universal or or Disney. Um, and, uh, and, and but the national thing also applies very much. I did a lot of work about ten years ago with Sony in the motion pictures group before the whole uh, Amy Pascal leaked email debacle. And it was interesting because there were no Japanese people anywhere really to be found on the premises, and yet much of the sort of ethos and natural movement of the organization seemed to be Japanese, um, as I understand it, in a lot of its um, sort of unspoken assumptions. So, you know, it ultimately is the, is, um, is the kind of leadership required different at different companies? Yes. Um, does it differ from large to small? Yes. Uh, and I think the challenge for boards and for, and for heads of HR is to figure out what are the kind of people who will succeed here. I do think it's going to be interesting. Look, everyone's got a prediction based on life after, life after COVID, um, which I don't think is going to be some bright, shiny, okay, we've now passed the line into everything is a new way. It's going to take a long time to work things out. But I wonder if, if heads of HR are going to be thinking about a different set of competencies and not just for the ability to work remotely, work with less direct supervision, um, have more internal resilience, uh, recognizing that this may not be the only pandemic we ever have. We're getting a lot more hurricanes these days. We're going to get more pandemics as well. Because sort of building into their cultures the ability to deal with um, more ambiguity, more business interruption. So I don't know if that was a great answer, uh, but you know, I, I was I was moderating a, I think an Aspen seminar a couple of years ago, and there was this big debate. I forget who was. Um, who was the CEO of GM, was it Wagoner back then? Uh, and we had a debate about whether, since Wagoner and, and Zuckerberg were both seen as effective leaders at that point, uh, I might be getting my leaders wrong. Um, it might've been Jamie Dimon actually. But anyway, it was two different CEOs and some wag in the, uh, in the audience said, if you picked up both these CEOs and changed their jobs, which one would do better? And I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's an interesting question. And it shows you that uh, different organizations need different kinds of leadership. One of the things I end up doing a lot of my work is an organization comes to a point where it realizes that the current leader is not the right leader. And then I get brought in to help assess that leader and try to figure out, can we turn this person into the right leader, which is usually something worth spending more time thinking about, or is it simply that, yes, um, for whatever reason, the person can't or they don't want to evolve to be the leader the company now needs, it's time to go in a different direction. Any other questions? Yeah, and this you might touch upon as you get into the seven stalls, but someone asked, are there tips to see these stalls coming? And when you talk about, you know, these people yeah. need the coaching and need the development, uh, yeah. are there leading indicators? And maybe you'll touch upon these. Oh, I absolutely will. And um, for those of you who like bullet points more than uh, long books, um, I got a copy of the book here, which I probably should look at once in a while. But um, in every chapter, so there's seven stalls, and then in every chapter, what we've got at the end of the chapter is a very, very simple chart. And what the chart says is, 
So this is for stall number two. Beware the danger. I can hold this up here maybe. So beware the danger, five or six bullet points that will give you a sense that this may be a stall you're about to experience. Assess and troubleshoot. How do I really understand if I am, if we are struggling with this particular stall? And then recover and reinvent. And here are some specific things. And earlier in the chapter, you'll get some tools and things that will help you to figure that out. So let me, um, let me take you through the seven stalls. And again, let's see if these resonate with people. Uh, and my hope is that they will. And to your point, if I can see something coming and avoid it, that's fantastic. If I can realize I'm stuck in the mud and here is a way for me to get out, I you know, put the car in low gear and stick a piece of cardboard under the tire and then I can get out. Um, and sometimes it is as simple as that. But it's as simple as realizing I need to get out of the car. I can't just keep, you know, cranking the gear shift and, and jamming on the accelerator. I need to do something different, which means get out of the car and address the situation in a different way. And, you know, sometimes getting out of the car requires you to get muddy, and that's some of the hard work of leadership. So let me take you through the stalls quickly, and then I will, I'll do another round where I'll talk about some of the solutions to the stalls. So very simply, very high level, and again, if, if others have seen stalls that we missed, or if you think there's, um, they should be combined into four and a half stalls, something like that, I'm, I'm open to hearing about it. But the first one we chose, and the order is very intentional, the first one we chose we call leader without a story. And we use the story very, very intentionally. So. Um, I did a PhD in literature, so I, I do believe that human beings are narrative creatures, but we use the word story more intentionally because what we find is that a lot of executives who've gone off and taken a business school class here or waving their MBA around, they get involved in these incredible debates about the semantics of mission, vision, purpose, strategy, and um, as somebody whose job it is to actually understand what these, what these words mean, the misuse of these words to both John and me is, is, is very disconcerting. So what we said instead, is, let's not get caught up in the whole, is this a mission or is this a strategy? Uh, and let's talk about the story. So the first stall you face as a leader is when you are failing to provide purpose. That purpose can be commercial purpose or it can be a higher purpose. And what we do know, if we know anything from the last 20 years, kicking off with the war for talent back, you know, seems like so long ago with the internet, uh, the dot-com bubble, and all of the ways that the workplace changed, all the way up through what we're looking at now with, um, you know, apparently millennials telling us that they want to be, the, work, the workplace to be a different kind of thing. They want the, the um, social contract to be different. Um, Purpose is very, very important to people. Uh, why do I work here? What is the, uh, wh what do I get from working here other than a paycheck? Okay. And leaders are absolutely required not only to um, tell that story, but to retell that story and to make that story one that others in the organization can make their own. And that way it becomes not just my story, but our story. The, uh, the second one, leader of team zero, this is when you let your team splinter. And we, we all assume that sort of corporate teams will form themselves, organizational teams will form themselves. We're all, we're all experienced, we've all been on teams before. Um, can you please uh, just kind of, let's all perform as a team, right? Okay, let's go. And it, it usually doesn't happen that way. One of the greatest sources of business for me is I get a call from somebody who knows somebody who worked with me and they say, Mark, we need your help because our senior team is just not working well together. And then they proceed to describe it, and, and usually it's the, the chief executive, and they describe it in ways that the problem is all about the team. You know, I hired these smart people, and I just don't know why they're not working well as a team. I certainly pay them quite a bit. You know, like, well, okay, let's talk a little bit about what the dysfunctionalities are in the team, and then what is your, how do you see your role in making this a higher performing team? So dysfunctionality in teams is, is probably... If there's one of these that we all will experience more than once in our careers, this is probably the one. The third one is, is probably my second favorite because it's the one that uh, is the most unnatural to me. And that is a failure to manage your stakeholders effectively. So earlier in our careers, we do a stakeholder map. We, we're, we taught how to do that in some kind of a project management program. And then we go, got that, check that off. Now that I'm a senior executive, you know, the whole project management thing is somebody else's job. We'll hire some smart MBAs to do that. Uh, and they fail to realize that now 
the management of stakeholders in a less transactional way is the single most important thing you can do. And you know, regularly when I'm working with CEOs, senior executives, we'll sit down and we'll draw a stakeholder map. And what they will realize over the course of doing this is, wow, I actually have a whole lot of people that I need to be constantly engaged with. And I don't have the time. I'm not making time for that. And what I need to do is have a more specific strategy for how I'm proactively managing some of these relationships and conversations. Okay. Um, nobody gets it. This is, uh, if you're walking around saying nobody gets it, you might have to uh, realize that it might not be them, it might be you. So nobody gets it is the, is the stall that has to do with, with communication in organizations. And you know, there's some very, very interesting um, insights here. You know, first and foremost, uh, in my 25 or 30 years of doing the work that I do, I have read literally thousands of 360s, executive assessments, um, performance reviews, and I've seen everything. I've literally seen everything except for one thing. I have never, ever, ever seen an executive faulted for over-communicating. Okay? I hear bad communication, not enough communication, self-centered communication, ineffective communication, uninspiring communication, but I've never heard, Mark, we get it. We understand the strategy stop talking about it. Never heard it. And what you realize in organizations is that organizations are, uh, are a material that does not transmit communication very well. And um, you have to say something, as a mentor of mine once said, at the point where you're getting absolutely physically sick of saying it, like you're going to throw up if you say it again, your people are starting to understand it. So this is a huge one and one that should not stymie people as much as, as it does. But again, it's realizing that nobody ever affected change through a memo. So you may be right. And your brilliance is you have absolutely the right idea. But if you can't get people to understand that, it doesn't matter. As this is the fate of all management consultants. They kill themselves coming up with a brilliant idea. And then it goes into a binder on, on the client's shelf and never gets uh, executed. Master of the old universe is a clever way, which is stall number five, a clever way of talking about stalling when you lose authority. Now, what does authority mean? Authority, in it, I'll make this really simple. Uh, authority means, why should I follow you? Which is the toughest question you can ask any leader. Why would anybody want to follow you? Well, I'm the boss. Great. Why would anybody want to follow you? Well, I'm smarter than they are. Good luck with that one, right? Uh, smartest guy in the room. You may have heard that particular story. So, um, so, so, so this stall is about not recognizing that as you take on more responsibility, you need to figure out other ways to generate followership from people. Right? And there's a lot of ways you can do this, but it, it really ultimately comes down to what is your authentic way of um, of recognizing why people will listen to you. And a lot of it comes down to, again, emotional intelligence. How are you engaging with them to make them feel it's about them rather than about you? We're gonna to come to the leading change stall in a minute. And uh, a lot of change efforts fail because the executives leading the change have not made the change relevant to the people they're asking to change. Um, there's a great, uh, if, so last plug for the book here, but if you were to, um, go to a Barnes and Noble and find the book on the shelf, uh, get a latte and just read the introduction, the foreword. Don't read anything else. The foreword was written by Norm Augustine, who's the former CEO of Lockheed Martin. And um, it's better than the book. I mean, I hate to say that. He's a, he was a brilliant CEO. Uh, after his retirement, he ended up writing a bunch of books, including a book on Shakespeare and leadership, which I'm very jealous of. Uh, but what he writes in the, what he, among the many really fascinating things he writes in the short number of pages we gave him was, I am a trained mechanical engineer. I am actually a rocket scientist, which when you're the CEO of Lockheed Martin, is a pretty good kind of background to have. But what I realized as the CEO is that for the last 10 years of my tenure, I actually never talked to an engineer. 
I never saw a diagram. All of my time was spent with my board of directors, with the, you know, on investment calls, dealing with regulators, dealing with the military, dealing with huge uh, commercial global entities. And my, my capability as an engineer was not the thing that gave me authority. That might have been table stakes at some point, but that wasn't why my people inside or anybody outside was listening to me. And I think it's people who, and we, we, we've used some film clips in the past. I think there's some, there's some film clips um, that we ref, refer to. There's a great um, movie, uh, The Crossing, about George Washington and why do people follow him rather than the vastly, I'm blanking on the guy's name, the vastly more uh, capable West Point educated type general. Um, uh, I, I love uh, Henry V, the Shakespeare play, and I talk about how does he engage his people before the Battle of Agincourt, so they will follow him into a battle that on paper they're gonna get massacred. Not only do they follow uh, the king, they actually end up winning the battle. And of course it's Shakespeare, so it's pretty, pretty dramatic. So this is the question, this is probably the hardest one to get people to engage with because it's so far away from like your resume, but the recognition that you will fail if people no longer follow you because they don't see something worth following. This is my, probably my favorite one, the hamster on a wheel. And this is the recognition that as a senior executive or any kind of a manager, really, uh, your most finite resources are time and energy, right? In an hour you spend and however many, whatever the joules, whatever the, the, the measurement of energy is, however, however much energy you spend on this thing over here is an hour and some energy you didn't spend on something else. After we wrote this book, a couple of other books um, became very popular. One of them is called Essentialism. It's, uh, it became a very, very hot book in the Silicon Valley particularly, which is all about ruthless prioritization. Greg McEwen is the author. I, I recommend it. I think it's a great book. Um, I think it could have been a little more essentialist. I think the book's a little too flabby, but, but the, point, the points he makes are very, very well taken, which is, as a friend of mine likes to say, in order to do great things, you have to not do some good things. And we get in a lot of trouble when we try, and it's, it usually is, is highly successful people who say, I can do more, Let's give me more to do. And maybe you can do more, but are you doing the things that really need to be done as well as possible? Uh, one of the things that I challenge a lot of my clients with is you must delegate everything somebody else can do. And they look at me like, well, but I like doing that. I'm like, okay, great. But you must delegate these things in order to free yourself up to do the things that only you can do. And that can be a tough one for some of us, particularly if, you know, it was the thing that bedeviled me when I was responsible for big global functions in my corporate roles, because I really like working with my clients. And ultimately when I, when I left those roles, because I realized I could make a living working one-on-one -on -one with executives rather than building huge global programs to impact people I would never actually meet personally. And then the final one, and in many ways, there's that old saying that the most important job of any leader is to create more leaders, uh, is stalling when you can't keep your leaders from failing. They, you will start to see that they run into these same stalls or they're not being coached and developed in a way that they can be effective with what the organization needs from them today, while they're also building capabilities for what the organization will need from them tomorrow. So that might be a good time to pause and see if there are any questions. And then I'll do one more run at these seven stalls. So you get a reminder of the seven stalls. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the ways that you might be able to see the stall coming and or work your way through it to get to the other side and, um, and not, get, not get kind of stuck in the mud. One question came in that I think really, really speaks to particularly stall number five. Um, so I, I, I can see why that's somewhere that people might get stuck because the question has already come in. And um, they asked, they said, you suggest that shedding responsibility is a way to increase sophistication, but in general, having more responsibility, budgets, people, et cetera, is a way to climb the ladder. Your ability to deal with the scope is often a measure of success. So I guess, you know, how do you make that transition really along that continuum from do to manage to lead? It seems like there's a, you know, I don't know if that manage period is kind of enough to get you to the wisdom that you really need to be successful. 
Great, a fantastic question, and I would have two answers. So hold yeah. me accountable to answering both of them. One is that it is a very conventional thought that the more territory I can take control of, the more leverage I'll have to have a bigger job. Let's come back to that one in a second. Let's do a little unpacking of do manage leads. I did not go into that. We could have a whole a whole hour on just do manage leads. So um, there's an old sort of saw that business school professors love to debate which is the difference between leadership and management. And this is sort of what I call the business school equivalent of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, which is the old you know, kind of divinity school question. Um, and with the Holy Cross audience, I'm assuming some of you will get that, uh, that reference. But the leadership versus management question is a complete fallacy. Leaders have to manage and managers have to lead. Maybe back in 1950, if you were looking at Ford and Procter and Gamble, we could make an argument that there was a distinct difference. So I, I was wrestling with this idea that leaders have to manage and managers have to lead. And then what I realized is that we all have to do things as well. And you know, look, my, my clients do tend to be, I've worked with Boeing and Ford and Schindler Elevator. I've worked in, in heavy industry, but most of my clients being in New York City are professional services, financial services, technology and media companies. And when you don't physically make something, I think, uh, you find people, law firms, for example, right? You don't get to be the head of a law firm because you did a really, really great job running a packaged goods company, right? I mean, we can move you from this industry to that industry in a lot of kinds of uh, uh, industries, but probably not in a law firm. And what you find is that people in a law firm become the managing partner of the region or the firm eventually because they were really the best lawyer. They had the highest buildings. Everybody admired them. People were afraid of them. They thought if we don't make her the head of North America, she'll leave and go somewhere else. And of course, the great paradox here is that while she, she may want to be the head of North America, once you give her the job, she's not going to like it. It's not what she wants to do. And she's going to spend all her time out serving her clients and not do a great job of running, um, running North America. So there's this really weird built-in paradox there. <laughs> Um, so when you think about do, manage, lead, what you recognize is that all of us spend time in each of those categories over the course of a week or a month. And oftentimes I'll have my clients get a piece of paper, I'll even force them to do it at the whiteboard because they'll cheat otherwise, and I'll say, get out your calendar and we're going to look at the last two weeks. And I want you to take me slot by slot in your calendar and I want you to write down what you're doing that you would char characterize as a do activity, a manage activity, and a lead activity. And we do this, and what we often find is that there is a heck of a lot more in the do column than there should be. And I don't prescribe that if you're an SVP, it should be 17% you know, do and 43% manage, and then whatever the, whatever the difference is for lead. But I do want to look at these sort of proportionally. And if you're in a significant management or leadership role, and you're spending a lot of your time doing, I think this is probably a problem. So now we'll start talking about it. And we'll start talking about, well, well, I had to be at that meeting. Did you really? Could you have sent somebody else to that meeting? Well, oh, I'm the only person who could write the initial draft of that board deck. Really? That's interesting. So what you're telling me is you haven't built any capability in your company to tell the board story. You can't scale this. It's not scalable. And then what we end up doing that I think is the aha, which maybe helps you make the jump from manage to lead as a mindset shift. And a lot of what I talk about when I'm working with executives is shifting your mindset. Comes down to the realization that management is not just about setting goals, monitoring progress, and holding people accountable. That's an important part of it, but particularly in the 21st century, one of the most important roles of the manager is to create organizational and individual capability, which means coaching and developing their people. Right? And I think the leaders who effectively move from more of a management role to more of a leadership role are the ones who really understand that because leading is really all about changing mindset. Right? There is a different future state we should be going to. We should be thinking differently about um, how the market is changing. This new entrant is going to cause some disruption. Uh, we need to address questions like, how do we deal with social justice issues in our organization? How do changes in the external world affect us? 
Should we have a point of view on these things that we express externally? Uh, should we change policies internally? Somebody else is going to come up with the policies. You're going to ask these questions and then in, in many cases actually model some of the ethical behavior that's required to do that. And I've given ethics a bit of, um, a, bit of a short shrift, particularly for a Jesuit audience, Jesuit college audience, because um, I, I don't think, um, I, I think ethics are, they're binary and you know, <laughs> You either have ethics or you don't. I don't know if you can teach ethics uh, to an adult. I think you can teach them fear. I think you can teach them compliance. But I'm fascinated by English has more words than any other language. So the second largest vocabulary is Chinese, who have about half as many words as we do. And then if you look at the Romance languages, for example, Italian, Spanish, they have about 10% of the number of words that English does. English loves new words. We take them from anywhere. But what's fascinating is that for many, in many situations, we use the same word to mean different things. So you think we have all these words. Why don't we have every word only means one thing? No, because we love to have subtlety uh, in our language. And, um, and do the right thing, right? The classic um, Spike Lee movie. When you bring that into organizations, it's just because do the right thing means do the technically, logically, objectively correct thing for the business, but it also means do the ethically and morally appropriate thing. Um, so, you know, I do think that, uh, that making the right decisions uh, when it comes to ethics is, is absolutely critical. Um, but I, you know, we, that would be a whole other topic, I think, for a webinar. Um, uh, it, it should be thought of as being woven in to all of this. And, you know, it's, it's really easy to see leaders stall when they simply lie or act in ways that are um, purely self-serving. Uh, and I think we smell that out pretty quickly. So when I talk about what are your sources of authority and I talked about authenticity, it's very difficult to fake your way through that. If you are not a person who cares about people, I'm not. I, I wish I did. Um, if you know your Myers-Briggs, uh, types. I am a very, very strong INTJ, which means I love problems and I see people as getting in the way of me solving their problems for them, right? But I've learned over time that the people who will pay me to solve problems are actually people. And so I have to take them into account. I'm being a little bit of a character, characterist here, but uh, those who know me will probably recognize some of this. So um, emotional intelligence is very much a learned behavior for me. If I can learn it to some extent, there's hope for everybody. Um, but I think, you know, I think this is kind of where I would be thinking about that question of how do I, this is a long answer, how do I get from uh, a master of doing to, uh, to a leader? One more thing I would mention about the kind of not wanting to give up control. I see this all the time. Um, and there is, I think it's a fallacy. It's, it's, I work with one, I won't name them. I work with a couple of the really big private equity firms and getting to partner at a KKR or a Blackstone or an Apollo is really, really difficult. And one of their senior partners, one of those firms said to me recently, because I was working with a, uh, somebody who was trying to make partner, extremely talented person. And he said, you have to show us that you can do something that nobody else can do. And that's when we'll make you a partner in this firm. And I would make the same case for most executives. Show us that you are really good at one thing. We don't need somebody who's great at a lot of things. We'll put you into a mid-level manager role and we'll keep heaving responsibility on you. And you will at some point get frustrated because you're going to say, I'm doing more and more and they're not promoting me because you haven't proven to us probably one of two things. There's one thing that you do that nobody else can do and we want to have you doing that right? Or you haven't proven to us that you are actually able to give things up and promote really talented people into those roles, which then allows us to promote you. If you're the chief bottle washer doing everything, I'm going to keep you in that job, particularly if you haven't got a vice chief bottle washer who we can promote because you're too valuable to me in that job to move you somewhere else. And I see it again and again. One of my first coaching responsibilities was it was in one of the, one of the cable companies, doesn't exist anymore, um, one of the big ones. And it was the person responsible essentially for the Northeast region. She grew up cable, bled cable, spoke cable, utterly brilliant woman, so committed. And as they began to promote her, she would refuse to give things up. Cause she's like, well, this is part of my portfolio now. And I'm like, okay. So we, we came to our own sort of um, Rubicon when she was struggling and they're like, we're gonna give you the chief operating officer role, 
but you must give some things up. And the thing she fell on her sword for was facilities. I have to keep facilities because that's the first thing I ever got. And, you know, those people love me. And I'm like, all right, if, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to lie in this bed if you make it that way. But, uh, but I, I, and I do think it's, um, it's an interesting challenge and we all feel that. I'm writing a little article right now on the paradoxes of leadership. And I think your questioner has, has framed a great paradox. The more power you give up, the more power you have. The more information you give away, within reason, um, the more power you have. We tend to hoard power, we hoard information, and that is maybe a short-term uh, path to being effective. It's not a long-term path. I mean, it's Machiavelli in the wrong way in an organization. Okie dokie. Anything else? Yeah, well, and thank you very much, because I think that was really, really, very helpful. Um, cause, and there are two questions that have come in that both have to do with, with wisdom, with developing wisdom in order to um, really reach these challenges of sophistication. And in particular, someone asked, how do you influence leaders you work with to take the time and energy to shift and reflect on problems needing a sophisticated approach? So how do you influence, but also how do you help people develop wisdom? Uh, wisdom. So there is a pyramid. Uh, and if anybody on the call knows the source for this, because I don't think I invented it, but I have not been able to figure out who did. I'd like to know because I want to write something about this. But there's a pyramid that I understand, which starts with da data at the bottom, and then information, and then knowledge, and then wisdom. And wisdom is the very top of the pyramid. And, you know, the reality is that everything in the world is data. We are completely surrounded by data. We're drowning in data. There's a reason why big data and AI are going to be the next big thing, we believe, because they're going to help us sort of survive data. Data in a context is information. Now it means something, right? I can give you a whole bunch of numbers, they're data. If you're interested in understanding, you know, the, the, the change in temperature to make a decision about whether or not climate change in this particular area is gonna have an influence on your industry in the next 15 years, now I'm looking for information. Bringing together information and drawing insights from it leads us to knowledge. Knowledge is the, is the capability to do things. I know how to do this. You know, I know how to make a good bowl of ramen. I know how to build a proper supply chain, right? It's knowledge. Wisdom is the one above that. The, the etymology of wisdom, this is like the one time in, um, in a corporate setting I get to use my PhD in medieval literature. So the etymology of wisdom is two Old English words, Anglo-Saxon words, wis and dome. Wis, of course, is wise. And dome does not exist as a modern English word in the same sense because the modern cognate is doom. And you think, when we think of, oh, doomsday, you know, the asteroid's gonna come and hit the, hit the world. What doomsday originally meant was judgment day. It's the day of God's judgment, the day of God's doom. It is not a bad thing for you if you've been a good person, it means you're gonna go to heaven. But doom means this judgment. Here go the bad people, here go the good people, I am gonna make a judgment. So wisdom means the ability to make good, wise judgments, to make good decisions. And the challenge with wisdom is it's very, very hard to translate to somebody else. Wisdom is typically acquired only by time and experience. I think the, the tragedy of the human animal is that with about 70 years on earth, we finally have figured out a lot of what's going on and now it's time to retire. Right? Uh, and I, can't, I, I can give lots of knowledge away, I can't give wisdom away. If I know for a fact that if I got in a time machine and went back 40 years, 30, let's call it 30 years, went back 30 years and said, hello, Mark, I am yourself 30 years from now. Let me tell you some really wise things. I would say to my future self, thanks, you know, and I go, this old guy has no idea what he's talking about because I could not even understand myself because I haven't lived those, those 30 years. Now, um, that's, that's not a problem. I think it's a reality. And I think once in a while, there is a wise person who can convey wisdom, particularly at certain moments where the person receiving the wisdom has had a crack 
open in reality to see the world in a slightly different way. And we look for those moments, right? Tuesdays with Maury, you know, there's a whole bunch of those Tuesdays where somehow that little crack got opened up. But for most of us, we're gonna have to take the time and be highly aware. I think sophisticated leaders are the ones who are able to step outside of the status quo and say, hmm, maybe things are a little bit different. Maybe applying a, you know, a regression analysis to this problem is not the right thing. And maybe I need to step back and think about the problem in a whole different way. So, um, so that's the question around wisdom. The question around how do you get somebody to be more enlightened is a very difficult one. So I don't do a whole bunch of you know, book tours and promotions. I don't have time, I got clients to serve. But every once in a while, someone will say, hey, I read your book and um, I really wanna give your book to my boss because he needs to read this book. And I'm like, oh Jesus, be really, really careful, right? You cannot go and say, look, this is how you should be. That being said, I find that the best way to help somebody who needs your help, but doesn't know they need your help and doesn't want your help is to sort of give them the problem. So if you, I get called in a lot to work with leadership teams and typically the, um, the leader will say, my team is all screwed up. You know, we need to put in place some swim lanes here. We need some role, you know, roles and responsibility clarification. I know you consultants have racy tools and things. Come in here. And I'm like, okay, yep, that's great. Uh, let me just talk to everybody on the team. So I spend an hour talking to each person, and then I create a report. And the report lays out all the dysfunctionalities as well as the things that are going well. And then I give the report to the CEO and I say, let's have a look at this together and figure out what's going on. I've got no idea what's going on here. I know exactly what's going on here, which is the leader has to change. And they're unwilling to be the leader that that team needs them to be. Now, they also may have wrong people on the team, people aren't in the right roles, org structures all screwed up, any number of things. But I can't go in and say, hey, look, I've been doing this for a long time, buddy. Let me tell you what your problems are because he's gonna say thank you very much and show me the door unless his board has insisted that he work with me and then he's just gonna to try to avoid me. If I say to him, this is the problem you own, I can help you describe the problem because I'm not a part of your system and then maybe together we can engage your team to solve this problem for you, that might work. And I've seen that work pretty well with leaders who need a little bit more of um, self-awareness or a little more sophistication um, as your uh, inquirer pointed out. Good? All right. So we've got what, another 15 minutes or so? Yeah, that's right. Great. Okay. So let me, I'm just going to run through, we've covered a lot more ground than I thought we would. And it's actually been more entertaining for me personally to be asked questions than just to read out slides. You know, I don't do this for a living. Um, I did a lot. Of, I, I was trained to be a college professor and I, I did earlier in my career do a lot of stand up leadership development. Um, Aspen Institute is not that. It's 25 people around a table talking about um, why does Plato actually matter today. Um, but I, um, you know, I, I don't love just reading out slides. I, I really wish we could be in a pandemic, but we can't do it. But I wish we could be in a room where we could be talking about this with a whiteboard. So I hope I'm giving you something useful. And to avoid really boring you, um, let me just run through these couple of slides quickly, and then we can see if we'll take a couple of more questions. But if you believe that there is a difference between complexity and sophistication. And if you're willing to say that I need to think differently about me, not just everything around me, in some situations, then you, you're building the awareness to see a stall coming and then to recognize that I need to do maybe not what I thought I should have done, to get my way through this stall. One of my favorite clients of all time, the single most high octane, high intensity person I've ever met runs the retail turnaround practice for one of the big global consulting firms. And I've been working with him for a couple of years. The original mandate was principally emotional intelligence, i.e. his partners didn't love him even, I'm being, I'm being gentle, his partners didn't love him even though he was the best doer in the entire company and he was not succeeding as a leader. But um, he had this great mindset change. And uh, every once in a while, we're, we're done working together, but we're still friends. We get together all the time. And every once in a while, he calls me and says, Nevins, I need to talk to you because I am about to do something that I know is the wrong thing for me to do. 
and I want you to talk me down off this ledge. I'm like, okay, that's great. Because what I know is he now realizes that when he gets in a situation, he has to do something different from what all of his intuitions and the demons inside him want him to do, which is fantastic. So if you can, look, we're all stumbling around in the dark. That's the human condition. So if you can somehow get a, a little bit of light going and see, this is a situation where I might do something differently. If you're, oh, there you go, stumbling around in the dark. If you're, um, if you're lacking a story, you have to recognize that your most important responsibility is to illuminate reality and tell a better story, right? And that is not hiring a branding firm. They can be very helpful. It is saying, my job is to be the custodian of this story. One of my favorite leadership books, um, Leadership is an Art, by Max Dupree, who ran Herman Miller Furniture back in the day, best company to work for, massively innovative, no Gucci coffee tables, Aeron chairs, you know, uh, all the Charles and Ray Eames furniture, mid-century modern stuff. He said, the first job of a leader is to define reality. And I just, I think that is one of the greatest things I've ever heard. He goes on to say, the last job of a leader is to say thank you, and in between, the leader is a servant. And we could unpack that one all day long. But your job in, in leading the organization effectively in avoiding this storytelling stall is to light and carry the torch. I had a, a CEO client, young CEO a couple of years ago, who would high energy, he would run around the company and grab random people and say, quick, tell me the story of this company. And he felt that was a really important part of his job. His people were terrified. You know, they'd see him coming and they try to hide because like, I don't know if I can answer the question. But what he was doing was saying, is this a story that means something to people? And if you can't tell the story, then it's not the right story. Um, uh, one of our case studies in the book said uh, he realized he wasn't telling the story effectively when his grandmother sat him down over tea and said, tell me exactly what you do for a living. And he stumbled and he couldn't tell the story. And then he, he, he runs big trade shows. He went to a trade show and he was being introduced by somebody who said, you know, so-and-so is amazing. His company is amazing. And they're like, this is great. What is, what is the company doing? And the, she said, uh, uh, hey, can you tell them what you do? Right? So, so one of his best advocates couldn't describe what the company did. So you need to be able to tell the story in a, in, in a simple and compelling way. When you think about a teamwork stall, you have to realize that you are the hub of your team, which is step number one. Then you have to realize that if everything is coming through you, it's not a team. So you have to figure out how do I create a team that can perform effectively because I am the hub, but then if I remove myself, the team still continues to work effectively. And you know, there's lots and lots of books on this topic. I happen to like John Katzenbach's work. He was a former McKinsey partner who started a firm, which is all about how do you create more high-performing teams. There's a recent book by Dan Coyle called um, The Culture Code, which is really about the, what makes every high-performing team work. And he talks about, again, purpose, so the first stall, and then he talks about psychological safety and willingness to be vulnerable, which I think probably embrace a couple of other stalls, including that idea of authority. Okay, um, one of the things that you have to do as a team is to have a charter. And you know, it may seem a little bit hokey to write one of these up, but I've got, a, I've got a, a template for how to do this. And rather than telling you the color by numbers, here's how you write a charter, I ask a bunch of questions. So for each of these bullet points, I say, this is a headline. And then underneath each of them, I have a series of questions, right? What is the purpose of this team? And I'll, I'll stop on that one because that's my favorite one. So I'll get hired into a new organization. Um, I'll interview everybody and then What'll happen is uh, we'll sit down for a three-day offsite somewhere, and I'll start with, "Look, I'm going to take you through, you know, everything that I've heard, and we're going to work through some of the issues here." But before I do that, what is the purpose of this team? And there's always some snickering. It's like, "Oh, look at the consultant, you know, hey, dude, we are a senior executive team, you know, we're a company. Every company has a senior executive team." I'm like, "That's great. What's the purpose of the team?" And I'm like, okay, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And then we end up spending a half a day talking about what really is the purpose of the team because form follows 
function, right? The, the, the purpose of the team will then determine what we do and how we do it. So a lot of the questions here for a team charter are very simple, but they're ones we have to answer. And the, and the ones down here about operating procedures are the ones that really get you in trouble. Do we run our meetings the right way? Do they have clear objectives? Do the right people attend the meetings? Do the wrong people not attend the meetings? How do we communicate? How do we work through conflict? How do we make good decisions, right? How do we continue to challenge ourselves to get better as a team, including um, figuring out what's not working well? Stakeholder stalls is all about building your reach. And here, this is a mindset shift that as a senior leader, talking with people and influencing them is a super important part of my job, not just a nice thing to do. One of my case studies here was a CEO I worked with early in my career, absolutely brilliant. I uh, was the CEO of a global uh, management consulting firm uh, they made him the CEO, his partners did because he was so brilliant. And what he did was he locked himself into his office for a year uh, to create a new strategy. And then he called a partners meeting, 200 partners in the audience and said, let me unveil to you our new strategy. He got to about slide three and they booed him off the stage, literally. And he was out of a job a month later. Because what, and by the way, I got to read the deck. It was brilliant. His mistake was he had brought nobody into the process. And the one thing you don't do with management consultants is present something to them because their job is to tear it apart, right? So if he, as I said to him many, many years later, I said, you know, if only you'd taken a cocktail napkin and just figured out who were your 20 biggest pain in the ass partners and flown around the world and bought him each breakfast and said, I got an idea here, what do you think, right? This would have gone entirely, he's like, yeah, you're right. Um, he, he ended up going on and unlike many consultants running a couple of companies and having a great career, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a very, very instructive moment for me that as my wife likes to tell me, you can be right and not have a good outcome. And I'm like, are you sure, honey? <laughs> She's like, yes. And I can give you examples every day of your life, Mark, of where that's the case. So again, I love stakeholder maps. We learn them in project management class. I think building it into your executive toolkit is important. Leading change. The headline here is, as my dear friend John likes to say, CEO stands for chief explaining officer. Everybody in a leadership role should think of themselves as being the chief explaining officer. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? How are we doing it? And what will you need to do to be successful? Change efforts typically fail, not because they didn't have a good reason to change or they didn't have a good plan to change. They fail because people don't understand the change. And so they can't become advocates and evangelists and enablers of that change, right? Uh, everyone loves to say, this is my favorite thing, uh, human beings don't like change, right? Everyone read Who Moved My Cheese and decided that people hate change. This is BS. We love some kinds of change. If I said to everybody here, as your reward for attending this webinar, you will be getting a check in your bank account for $10,000. That I believe is a change to your bank account and I guarantee no one is gonna have any problems with that. What people don't like is they don't like change they don't understand. Because then they're going, this is either gonna make my life more difficult or I finally figured out how to be successful here or not have to work too hard being successful. And now you're telling me I have to do something different. And I don't understand why I have to do something different or why it will be good for me to do something different. I once worked with a senior executive team who knew they needed to make some significant changes um, or they were gonna no longer be the leader in their industry. So they sat down to put together a rationale for change. And the, the headline they came up with was, we want to raise the stock price $10 in the next year. And they went into breakout groups and came back and this was their best idea. And I'm looking at it, I'm kind of going, so let's see, you're running a public company, 40% of your, of your staff is unionized. Um, very, very few people have any kind of an equity stake in this. And you really think this is gonna motivate your people to work harder. Yes, let's work really hard to make our senior executives wealthy. You know, This is not a good explanation of why we need to change. So think about that. Um, your stall in authority, requires you, we like to use the expression, John and I, um, you know, 
as both of us trained in the Aspen Institute methodology, really believe that there is wisdom out there. Um, you know, uh, uh, Plato and Aristotle and Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau are not easy to read because wisdom is not easy to translate. But I'm not, I'm not telling you to go off and you know, read 19th century political ethic and ethical and moral philosophy, but I am telling you that you need to try to figure out as you, as you uh, rise up in an organization, what are the things that will cause people to want to follow you? And a lot of that will ultimately come down to you, you rethinking what is my purpose here? If your purpose is to make your own life better, you may, you may do very well in that, but it's gonna be very, very hard for you to generate significant followership based on that. Because people are going to say, I, that's great, but I don't want to follow you. And they, and they vote with their feet, right? People join companies, people leave bosses. Uh, you can charge up the hill and you could be brave and strong and courageous. But if you turn around and nobody is following you, you have no authority as a leader. And that's at some point, that's going to be a stall you can't overcome. We talked about the stall and focus. Um, don't be a hamster on a wheel. Uh, if you're going to work really hard, make sure that you're, that you're, investing your time in a way that's actually going to move things forward. I, again, I like really simple tools. I'm the guy who likes to read books with footnotes, but when it comes to getting things done, I like simple, pragmatic, and usable tools. This is the old Eisenhower matrix um, where we, we sort things into urgent and important, and then we really hold ourselves accountable to staying on the right side of that, um, that we are you know, ensuring that the things that are both important and urgent are getting done. If the things that are low importance or high urgency, we either um, you know, delegate them to somebody or we, we do them, but we don't let them take over our entire agenda. Um, the bottom left corner, you shouldn't be spending any time at all in there if you can avoid it. A wise client of mine, actually a mentor of mine, once said that everyone says you should focus on the top right-hand corner. Actually, the top right-hand corner should never have anything in it because if it's really important, it should never become urgent. And I thought that was really brilliant. Uh, and then you know, when, I, when I work on this stuff, I love it. Occasionally, I'll go into one of my client's offices and they'll have this drawn up on their whiteboard and they'll be writing. I'm like, this is great. This guy's actually doing this stuff and hopefully seeing some benefit. The other layers I like to add in on understanding when you have high versus low energy, um, understanding um, what can really be delegated. I have become recently a huge fan of time boxing. There's a big article about five years ago in HBR that explains what time boxing is. What time boxing basically is, is taking your to-do list and taking your calendar and making them one document. So rather than saying, I really have to write that article and it's been on my to-do list for four weeks now, but I, my calendar is full of other stuff, as I say, I want the article first draft done this week. Therefore, I'm gonna block out two hours on Tuesday morning I'm going to get up, going to go work on in, have to be really high energy, make a huge pot of coffee, and I'm not even going to look at my email. I'm going to turn everything off, and by God, I am going to write a first draft of this article between 8 and 10 a.m. Okay? So that's another way that you can think about doing this. this. This is the one that's kind of the most personal, but what I see all the time is that followers intuitively see, even if they can't observe it, where you're spending your time and energy, and oftentimes they're saying, Mark, you... You need to spend more time with us. You need to spend more time with customers. You, you know, I don't know what you're doing when I don't see you, but whatever you're doing, it's not what you need to be doing. Okay. And then finally, um, the stall in leadership development is become a leader of leaders. And you know, I think the key thing here is not feeling that you can just outsource this. Oh, yes. Well, we have a very good head of HR, and he is building a brand new leadership development program. I hear it's going pretty well. Great. Um, well, what are you personally doing to develop other leaders? Oh, that's the job of my talent head. No, it's not. That's your job. Um, and I, I, can, I can probably close with this anecdote. If I, whenever I ask people to think about the absolute best boss they ever had, people can think of that person right away. And then I say, tell me what made that person such a great boss? And they reflect on it and they come back with five or seven things. And I, can, this, I could be like a mind reader. So this is like some kind of a, of a party trick because I can guess what they're going to say at this point. They're going to say, this person made time for me. This person invested in my development. I mean, they gave me opportunities, but they gave me a safety net. Um, they challenged me. 
they they modeled the way in terms of their own ethics and their you know their their commitment to their other people. Um, you know, they pulled me up when I was down. They they had a big heart. They had great vision. They never say, "Boy, this person could build the most incredible Excel models," or "This person was a genius. They had an MBA from Harvard. That's why they were my best leader." Right. So think about that um, and recognize that the leaders who are really going to be effective and who are probably most likely to avoid stalling are the ones who create a great cadre of leaders around them. Okie dokie. Uh, you've all seen the nine box, I'm sure. Again, this is one thing that I don't think HR people should be responsible for. HR is a tremendously important function for giving us tools. Leaders and managers have to own the execution of our talent strategy. And they really know who, who the best leaders are. Don't leave that for a performance management system. Uh, this is too much detail for today. If you, this, look, here's, if, if, you, if you want to see what I'm talking about here, um, I've, got a, I've got a template that has specific questions in each of these areas. If you send me an email, I will send you the template. It's in the book as well, but it's a great tool for you to use to think about how am I managing my own growth as a leader? And then you can take it and use it with your direct reports. So send me an email. I will send this back to you. And um, it's a PowerPoint, so you can actually just fill it out and use it. Okay. And that's about it. So closing idea, leaders don't need to reinvent their organizations. They need to reinvent themselves. And you know, I, I ask all of my clients, um, if you want me to work with you, the way I can be most effective is if you believe that some of the work we have to do is on you, not just on your team or your company or your culture. There you go. Thank you very much. This is this has really been great. I mean, even after reading the book and talking to you many times, I still took lots of notes. So I appreciate your candor and, and everything that you bring to this work. I can really feel the passion that you have for it. So thank you very much. Um, one question that came in that I think really speaks to that last point, actually, about, you know, changing yourself as opposed to the organization. The question came in about you know, what, what do you do if you are fully on board, ready to change, ready to, to tackle problems of sophistication and, and make these shifts within yourself, but the people above you are still stuck in that old mindset? Do you it's have similar to the other question, to some extent, yeah. like, can you get them to change? Yeah. Um, asking, not telling is generally a better way. Um, I think if you have, look, you're not going to, you're not going to walk into the boardroom and put this on the table. Um, I'm a huge believer in non-transactional interaction. I'm an introvert, so this is not easy work for me, but uh, I think the best meal of the day is breakfast. And if you can get people to sit down with you, usually nothing has gone sideways at breakfast time by lunch. I hate it. I hate lunches. It's like, I'm, I'm busy. Don't make me stop what I'm doing to go have lunch. I'm not interested in that. Uh, yeah. I, I would fail as a Belgian. I could not do a two hour lunch with white wine. Um, but breakfast is amazing because we can sit down and usually people are not overly stressed. You know, they've carved out an hour and a half or whatever it is. And I think you have to say, I'm struggling with this. I think we have an opportunity here. What am I missing? Um, and I think ultimately, you know, and this is, this is going to be, unfortunately, not maybe what you want to hear. Ultimately, you have to decide if this is an organization that shares your values. Mm -hmm. Is this an organization that really where you say, if they can get it, and I would urge you to try to help them to get it, but ultimately, you can only push water uphill so much, right? It, the, culture, the culture of any organization is defined for better or for worse by the visible behaviors of its leaders. I don't care what your value statement says. I don't care what your leadership competencies are. You know, you can go on eBay and find the Enron code of values. It is a beautiful document. It'll bring tears to your eyes. You know, didn't, didn't work out for them because they didn't actually live by those values. So, you know, to some extent, I think the challenge is on you as a leader to control what you can control. And maybe you're struggling with getting it done with the layer above you, but look at your layer, look at your peers, look at the people below you, figure out what you can control. And then maybe what you end up doing is you see the benefits of doing that and you become one of the more high performing units in the company. And then now the executive team is coming and knocking on your door going, hey, what exactly are you doing over here? And you're like, ah, well, let me tell you about this because it's not just about having you know, the best mousetrap. It's about thinking about how are we deploying the mousetrap or maybe recognizing that we don't want to be killing the mice, we want to be capturing them and 
putting them on wheels to get more energy. I mean, I'm, it's, I'm running out of metaphors here, but I think you know yeah. what I mean. Yes, yes, perfect. Well, and, and one last question that came up that I think um, would really speak to people who are at smaller organizations. Someone asked specifically in terms of a startup, um, you know, and, and I think anyone at a smaller organization would probably find the same problem of, you know, for smaller, smaller organizations where you have to do manage and lead, as yes. you, you had referenced, really that everyone needs to to a certain degree, but that it's heightened in these smaller organizations. How, what kind of advice do you give to those, say, leaders of startups or leaders of small nonprofits where they're, they're you know, feet on the ground, kind of getting yeah. their hands dirty while also inspiring leadership? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of case studies of that kind in our book. Um, Trevor Boyce is the CEO of, and I'm blanking on the name of his company now, but it's a, it's a very, very sophisticated engineering measurement uh, company. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a very, very sophisticated uh, technical brain. And what he, his father started the company, he took it over. And what he realized at one point was that um, he needed to be not in the business of doing, but in the business of creating a culture of doers. Um, and, and he was able to make that transition. A lot of founding CEOs don't. I mean, I'm not an expert in startups, although I've worked with many of them. I've worked with many family businesses, which I try to avoid doing whenever I can, because the psych psychological dimensions there are a little bit beyond my uh, capabilities. But uh, there comes a point when you are no longer maybe the right person to be running this company or in any one of these roles because the company has outgrown you or because you don't want to do that. You want to do something else. So you know, if you followed the, the kind of the evolution of Google, there were lots of people who left at certain points and I'd pick them because they're a famous case study and they didn't leave because, you know, they just wanted to cash out. Um, they essentially left because they said, and I'm going to simplify this, this has been great, but this is not the kind of company I want to work for anymore. I want to work for a place where we're all working off of one table and, you know, I'm doing everything. And I think that's great. I made that decision myself. After 10 years in big global corporate roles, I said, you know what? I don't want to fly around the world and argue with the board anymore. I just want to go and talk to people and help them be more effective. I've, learned, I've gotten enough wisdom now that I think I can go off and do that. And I think that's a very important question for all of us. And I think if you're a founder or if you're somebody in a startup, asking that question before your board comes to you mm. and ask that question is really important, which again, requires a certain kind of mindfulness. And I've seen lots and lots of, you know, and people who are entrepreneurs are very tenacious. And they're going to get on that bike and they're going to, they're going to, you know, push that bike until they're at 20 million and then they're going to hit a wall and they're going to think, I am just going to pedal this bike harder and get through this wall. And you're not, um, you need to now step off the bike and say, we, I don't need to be riding a bike. I need to create, you know, a caravan of buses that are going to get us from 20 million to 200 million. Um, and you know, that really is a sweet spot there where you see a lot of private equity firms come in and say, you're done. We're going to put a new team. We're going to get them to 200 million, then probably swap them out as we, you know, go to an IPO or some kind of an event. Fantastic. Well, so, thank you. Self-awareness, right? It's yeah. all, isn't, that, isn't that what we're supposed to learn in our Jesuit education? You know, <laughs> humility and self-awareness. So I think those are things that we can bring to the work life and, and you know, kidding aside in really, really meaningful ways. Right. Um, I'm not a career coach, but oftentimes, sometimes I'll be in a conversation with someone who's really struggling and I have to ask the question, is this the job you really want to be in? Do you want to be in this job in five years? You're telling me you want to be the chief operating officer. Why do you want that? Because right. I, I really want it. Well, why do you want it? And be careful what you ask for. Yes. Right? Nearly everyone who makes partner in a strategy firm wakes up the next day with a hangover and then realizes within a, within a couple of weeks, holy crap, this is not what I thought it was going to be. Can I go back to being a principal again? Because this is, I didn't sign up for this, yes. right? So be careful what you ask for when it comes to these inflection points. Yes. No, and I think you've given us so many really, really great tips. And so many people have, have written in the comments just how appreciative they are for your insight and what a provocative discussion this is. And it's gotten a lot of people thinking in new ways. So thank you very much. Because I know, I've, as I mentioned, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. And I can tell that other people got just as much out of it. So oh. thank you. Truly my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I hope it's been of some use. And as I said, um, you've got my email address there on the screen. 
uh, send me a note if you have a question or if you want me to send you the blown out version of any of the things that I showed. I'll make sure more that you've got the slides. Um, right. so you can share them, but uh, you know, anything that you'd like to hear more about, I can probably send you a template or a, a framework of some kind. Fantastic. Fantastic. And thank you to everyone who's who joined us on today's call. Uh, for those of you uh, who would like to watch it again, it has been recorded and I'll share it out with everyone once it's up on the Holy Cross YouTube page. If you have any questions, you can contact me too. I'm just at mcmini at holycross.edu. And uh, please share advice, share um, tips for future talks. I love feedback. So uh, please uh, don't be a stranger. And I hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. I hope to see you on another one of these uh, very soon. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take it easy.